Classes in Polymer Dynamic, based on George Philly's book, Phenomenology of Polymer Solution Dynamics, Cambridge University Press, 2011. And today, this lecture is Lecture 5, Electrophoresis in Conclusion, Diffusion, and a few words on scattering. In any event, I'm Professor Phillies. This is still course 597D, Phenomenology of Polymer Solution Dynamics. And what I'm going to be doing is to finish off today the discussion of electrophoresis, and then we will advance to the discussion of scattering. <coughs> what we did last time was to sample many of the individual measurements that have been done that give information using electrophoresis on how polymers move through solution. The general objective in many of these things is to say, well, we have experiments that were really done to discuss how do we optimize separation processes. However, at the same time you're doing that, because you are doing separation, you're looking at how a whole bunch of different probes travel through a polymer solution when you apply an electrical field, and therefore at the same time you're getting information on separation, you're also getting information on the polymers. We did find a few interesting peculiar bits and pieces, for example the interesting observation of Rodbard and Krombach that the large particles are less slowed down by the polymer solution than the small particles are. Now you might propose to explain this, and it is a reasonable explanation that while the par large particles experience more drag, they also have more surface area and more charge and larger ion clouds, and therefore the large particles have more force on them at the same time. And that's a fundamental issue in interpreting electrophoretic studies. Uh, there are a few parts of the chapter that we skipped. For example, uh, there are a number of people who have studied what happens if you apply an alternating electrical field. Now, if you just apply a simple AC field, uh, it must be the case that the charged objects spend half their time going this way and half their time going that way, and there's no net migration. So you need some clever alternative way of measuring the motion of the particles, and Ken Schmitz and several other people discuss using interferometry, light scattering, and you measure the particles going back and forth by direct means. However, you can actually do this. In gel electrophoresis, the use of alternating field directions to induce migration has actual substantial practical application. The reason for that is that a gel really does have pores and obstructions. And suppose here, is, here comes our DNA molecule, and it happens to go down a path that comes to an end. It's now stuck. Uh, however, if you back it up and try again, if you're clever, if you go back and forth, back and forth, the uh, polymer molecule uh, will find, eventually find a hole and keep on going. And therefore, alternating fields allow you to do things that straight ahead does not. But that's in a gel that has real obstructions. The fact that you do not see this effect in polymer solutions, at least I've never seen any reference to it, though there's a very large literature out there, tends to suggest that gels do not have the same obstructions they have permanent obstructions, that solution and solutions do not have those obstructions, so that solutions and gels are really very different. Now we push ahead to section 3.9, page 73, and we will consider generalizations as to what we find experimentally. And the first generalization is that the chalk always goes for a walk if I turn my back. Nonetheless, the first generalization is that we can measure an electrophoretic mobility 
And the form of its concentration dependence is more or less a stretched exponential. Now, if you look carefully at the data where we plot mu versus c on some axes and c curves that look like that, if you look carefully at the measurements at very low concentration, uh, you find that things are not slowed down as much as they are on the rest of the curve. Nonetheless, the measurements do lie on the solid lines, say figure 3.1, and this is because you really do see a stretched exponential concentration dependence. Uh, historically, the statement there is a smooth curve was very surprising. The reason it was very surprising is that the people who were doing the measurements had a particular physical model in mind as to how polymer solutions behave. It was the transient lattice model in which at elevated concentrations, but only at elevated concentrations, the polymer solution, polymers entangle and therefore If this is the concentration at which entanglement occurs, and you should realize I don't really mean it's a sharp line, it could be a band. Above here, you start seeing separation, that was what was expected, and below here you don't. And if you believed in those models, your expectation was this, and surprise, surprise, you see something else. Now, if you instead had, had advance notice of my book or read my earlier review articles, you would have known that when you study polymer self-diffusion or probe diffusion or any of a variety of other related physical properties, you see curves like this in which polymers slow each other down even at very low concentration, and you would not have found this result at all surprising. Uh, the next point, approximately speaking, you have these parameters alpha and nu. And if you look down here, or you look up here, you find that a single curve with the same parameters works all the way along. If you thought that the mechanism of motion had one form down here, and a different form up there, well, it, things could lie on a smooth curve. After all, there's going to be something in the middle where if you thought there was one mechanism here and a different mechanism there, you'd expect there'd be some region in here, wide or narrow, in which both mechanisms were working at the same time. And therefore, you might have a smooth, the magic word is crossover, from down here to up there. A crossover is sort of the same as a transition, but you want to be careful not to use the word transition in discussing this, because I will say transition, and people will think phase transition. Well, phase transitions are sharp. If I take a block of aluminum and melt it, it's either a solid or it's a liquid, uh, melting is a complicated issue, not entirely well understood. However, there's a sharp change at one temperature. And if I say transition, people will think I mean a sharp change at one concentration. Well, I don't have a theoretical model that predicts that. We just say we have a region here, we have a region there, and we have a zone of mystery in the middle. And because we go from here to there, you would at least think that if this dynamics were different than that dynamics, you might get the same functional form for the concentration dependence. After all, the same functional form comes out of differential equations, not out of the detailed physics. But if you've got two different things going on, you might think that alpha and nu ought to change as you get from someplace here to someplace there. Well, they don't. If you hunt way back to section 3.1, you may remember that I mentioned scaling laws. And a scaling law tells you 
u is proportional to o c to the, I'll put in the minus x because it's going down, m to some power gamma, where m is the molecular weight of the matrix polymer. And therefore, if I go on to a log-log plot, you might expect, if you believe this, you get straight lines. Well, if you put the data onto a log-log plot, you don't get straight lines. You get smooth curves. Of course, if I have a smooth curve like this, and a theory that predicts a straight line of some slope, it is always the case that there will be some region where the straight line is tangent to the smooth curve, especially when the smooth curve has wiggles in it, and the number of data points along the smooth curve isn't incredibly huge. There was no reason to put an incredibly large number of data points on that smooth curve for the purposes of the paper. Um, I'll come back to that in a second. However, no matter what slope you predicted within reason, well, not this one, clearly, uh, you find there will be some part of that curve which is tangent to your straight line. And now we come to a basic scientific issue, and the word is falsifiable. Falsifiable is a basic property of scientific theories. It means they make predictions that are concrete enough that you can prove they're wrong. Um, how do we know <clears throat> scientific theories are true? Well, there are sorts of two sorts of things. First of all, there are huge numbers of facts, and the model, whatever you have, makes predictions that predict lots of facts and are consistent with things that are outside of that. Um, falsifiable means the theory makes predictions that make enough sense that you can tell they're wrong. I mean, there might be lots of different theories, in fact there are in polymer dynamics, that predict more or less the same thing, but you have to make some prediction which um, is sufficiently concrete that you can show it's incorrect. The scaling prediction, with a number here, in the absence of a prediction as to whether the slope is like this here or here, it's wrong here, um, approaches not being falsifiable because the model does not predict the concentration regime within which you're supposed to see this behavior. Or if it does, it makes predictions that don't seem to be, well, we'll get to that in a bit. But if you want to have a scientific theory, it has to have the property that makes reasonably concrete predictions, and the predictions you are actually uh, can be shown to be untrue if the model is wrong. <clears throat> In any event, we do not see scaling behavior. Also, the model predicts gamma equals zero. The model predicts, this is a general property of obstruction type models, that if you have very long polymers, it does not matter what the polymer molecular weight is, they will slow down the motion of the probes to the same extent. Because if you have a fixed concentration of really long polymers, it doesn't matter how long the polymers are, the holes between the chains are the same size. Well, <clears throat> if you go back and look, I give you a number of curves where I plot mobility versus polymer molecular weight, or I plot mobility versus concentration, and what you get I don't necessarily use the axes that gives curves like that, is that if you increase the molecular weight of the matrix, the electrophoretic motion is slowed down. That is a very strong piece of evidence that the obstruction poor Ogston type models are entirely incorrect, because they make a very concrete prediction 
and the very concrete prediction is wrong. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> what else do we see? Well, we can measure the mobility. It's actually the same set of measurements, because what is done experimentally is you fill your capillary tube with a polymer solution of some concentration. You put in at one end a whole bunch of probes of different size. You apply a field and weight. And as the probes travel, they spread out. And by the time they get to the far end of the capillary, they are coming out at different times, showing they have different mobilities. So one experiment gives you the mobility of a whole bunch of different probes. And what do we find? Well, in pure water, all these probes of different sizes have the same mobility. Why? Well, they have different charges, and therefore, though the details are very complicated, they have different forces on them, but they also have different hydrodynamic drags. They're slowed down by the solvent when they try to move. And those two effects exactly cancel. And therefore, if you look back at O figure 3.2, you notice there are these lines of dots at the top where the probe, diffu where the probe mobility um, is independent of probe size. In polymer solutions, at some point, though, you see a zone like this. in which there's a stretched exponential in the probe size. And then you hit a crossover regime. And you have a very weak power law. And it really is a weak, it is, does appear to be a power law, though it might not be because you don't see very much of it. And it's a fairly weak power law. And in this region, the mobility changes very little with probe size. <clears throat> so if you try to do an electrophoretic separation, <clears throat> all these things travel at about the same rate and therefore do not get separated very much. And so you can do separations here nicely and out here life is less interesting. I did, however, note There, you can also do a measurement of P as a function of applied electric field. And for weak fields, the, um, not pro, P, mu, mobility is a function of electric field. And in weak fields, the mobility is independent from the electric field. That is, you change the electric field, and if you increase it, things go faster. But it's a purely linear response. So it's like um, stretching a spring. There is a linear regime if you have a nice spring, Hook's and you, you hit, hmm? Hooke's law. Hooke's law, precisely. And I have hanging, a mass hanging from a spring, and it's stretched. And if I double the mass, I double the stretch. Or if I have a wire and I apply an electric field, there's a current. And Ohm's law, if I double the applied voltage, I double the current. Well, that's the linear regime. However, if you take the electric field up, there is a point at which you get a transition and you go into a nonlinear regime. And in the nonlinear regime, the mobility goes as e to the a, where a is some weak power. And that transition is fairly sharp. Similarly, this transition is fairly sharp, but it has two features. The first feature is the position of the transition depends at least somewhat on concentration polymer concentration. Not very much, but if you look hard at the graph, you'll see it appears to depend. Furthermore, if you look at the points, there seem to be a few points here 
where there is a transition regime where you can actually clearly and unambiguously see that there is a transition regime. That is, you have points here that lie on the curve. You have points here that lie on the curve. And in between, there are a few points which really do quite visibly sit above. And so you have a more complicated issue. Now, one thing you might propose, I didn't try testing this numerically, is that you have a mechanism that gives you this curve, you have a mechanism that gives you that curve, and the two mechanisms are additive. And therefore, if you had done a fit and say, said both of these are going on all the time, um, the sum of this straight, not quite straight line and this smooth curve in the intermediate region would tend to rise up a bit. And it's possible if you were clever you could find a better set of description than the one I give in the book. However, as a practical matter, since someday you may be writing your own books, uh, you should realize that at some point either you stop or things will never come to an end. And of course there are people who decide to write a book until it's perfect and they start when they're a little older than you are and gee, 40 years later they claim they're still writing and polishing the book but nothing ever gets completed. You'd like to get things done. It's better. Okay. Point number three. It is possible, if you are clever, to produce polyelectrolyte molecules that are not linear. They're shaped like starfish, star polymers. And if we take two polymers of the same M, same M, you discover that the mobility of the linear polymer and the mobility of the star polymer are very nearly the same. They're, well, they're big huge things. They're being dragged through solution. If I look at a little bit of polymer here, and a little bit of polymer here, they basically see the same environment next to them. Yeah, there are arms out here in this case, but they're way far away. Okay, and therefore if I say the two polymers have the same total molecular weight, because there is a total molecular weight dependence, that's why we can do the separation. Um, the polymer here, yeah, it knows there are pieces out there in some sense, but it doesn't care if they're attached like this, or if they're just stretched out like this. Okay, so the polymer, little, each of the little pieces of polymer, well maybe not the piece right here, sees exactly the same environment whether it's on a star polymer or a linear polymer. And therefore it moves the same way. Now why, is this why might this be disturbing? Well, if you were in the really low field region, and maybe you weren't, but if you were at really low fields, you would say, the way this chain can move through solution, of course it's a random coil, the way it can move through solution if I apply an electric field E is that it moves along its own length. And it wiggles back and forth somewhat because there's diffusion, but there are models that say, this is the reputation model, it can't move sideways it can only move by traveling along its own length. So first this end was here, and then it's here, and then it's there. Ditto, this end is here, and here, and there. But the chain segments here can't have moved sideways very much. That's a reputation picture of motion. Now why is this a problem for the poor star polymer? Here's the poor defenseless star polymer and it's stuck in a place where reputation works. For example, inside a solid cross-linked gel. And there are chains, other chains around it like this. The only way this piece 
can move that way. Whereas for this arm to retract and this arm to retract and ball up. And now the lump can move sideways. And after the lump has moved sideways, the arm can extend again. You might realize that for this polymer, big long piece of polymer chain arm to contract like this is statistically very unlikely. And therefore, if you thought this were the dominant chain motion, star polymers would be almost immobile in polymer solutions. Well, someone did the experiment. And the answer is if you have a real cross-linked gel, you can actually video microscopy, watch the star polymers be dragged through the polymer solution, come up to the surface of the gel, and crash to a halt. Because they've hit the surface, they can't penetrate it to get in, so they just sit there, they can't do anything else. The linear chains, while they have to work hard to find a hole in the gel, can come along through the linear a solution, hit a real gel, and keep on going, it's a somewhat clumsy process, into the gel. The star chains can't. In a real gel, star polymers are trapped. Uh, in polymer solutions, that's not true. Star polymers are about as mobile as linear polymers are. Um, there are some other mechanisms which would explain how the polymers are moving. And one mechanism you could imagine is here is a piece of charged polymer that's trying to move this way. And it is currently delayed because wrapped around it is one of these neutral matrix polymers, or a whole lot of them. The charged polymer is applying a force this way. This polymer is sort of stuck, at, or at least somewhat attached to its neighbors. So what happens is that this chain is dragged this away, and it's like putting your um, fork into some very soft noodles. You raise the fork, and the noodles fall off the fork. Yes? Yeah. Well. That mechanism, in principle, permits linear and star polymers to move through polymer solutions. And since this little area here doesn't care very much about the star, it does lead to the picture that the linear and star polymers could move at about the same speed. OK. What else? Question? Yes. Um, how did the star polymer retract from when? Oh, oh, how does it manage to do the retraction? Yeah. Well, the, the arms are moving through diffusion. They do random motion. Yes? So one of the random motions is like this. And it's, of course, random, but there is some statistical likelihood that it's all the way curled up spontaneously. And you have to, in that picture, wait for this to happen spontaneously. Now you will correctly say if the arm is really long, really long arms, you don't expect the arm to be able to curl up like this very often. And in fact the prediction is that the mobility of the star chain falls exponentially with the length of the arms. Exponential fall-offs are really very sharp. Okay. No, that was a very good question. Okay, let us shove ahead and let us push to figure 3 15 on page 76. <clears throat> that is, one of the things you can say is I have this picture, or at least this function, that describes the measurements well. And one of the questions I can sensibly ask is, well, are its parameters doing something at least vaguely intelligent? So we are sitting on page 76, and what I have done is to take the parameters alpha and nu. And alpha and nu 
<coughs> are different for different size probes. So what I have done is to plot alpha and nu as a function of probe size. And the sort of question is, do I get something resembling smooth curves? Do I get something that looks as though it could in principle come out of the physical theory? Or do I simply get a hash and the hash would sort of send me the message that, yeah, you're getting smooth curves that fit the theory, that fit the data, but they aren't really telling you anything. <clears throat> well, you do actually see smooth curves. I have plotted this for several different polymer matrices. And if you look up from the bottom to the top, you notice that as the um, concentration of the matrix has changed, the curves drift in a systematic manner up or down. Uh, or, I'm sorry, yeah, that's what I meant. Uh, polymer molecular weight has changed. I said concentration. If you change the molecular weight of the polymer, you get somewhat different curves. And that's sort of what you would reasonably expect. Okay. Now, are, there are people who have, other people who have tried to do analyses of this sort of measurement <coughs> in terms of different models. There is an extremely effective literature. The author who is worth reading, well, not the only author, but a very good author is a fellow by the name of V.O.V. Who has done very systematic studies of electrophoresis in cross-linked gels, and in cross-linked gels, the uh, reputation entanglement obstruction models work quite respectably well. And there are some very nice papers in, um, for example, reviews. I think it's reviews of modern physics, if I recall correctly where he shows how polymers move through gels and gets reasonable agreement. However, he does briefly, very, very briefly, discuss solutions, saying that um, it seems fair to say that the present theoretical understanding of polyelectrolyte separation and semi-dilute polymer solutions is rather unsatisfying, or Experimental data appear to display a very smooth evolution of the mobility across the entangling transition, which cannot be accounted for by existing models. And then, of course, uh, that DSDNA fragments can be separated in polymer solutions well below their entanglement concentration. Um, it's a surprise. Such a result was believed to be impossible within the framework of the existing theories. Since a few polymers aren't entangled, the then exist theories that these people were using, they weren't the only theories even back then, didn't predict what you actually found experimentally. Okay. So we have now chugged through, and I have discussed polymer solutions and electrophoresis in polymer solutions. Now I'm going to push ahead and discuss something else. Sorry. Question. I have a question about electrophoresis. Um, is there any matter if we use electrolyte polymer and then will it different from the other polymer in your electrophoresis? Okay, the issue is as follows. Electrophoresis substantially but not completely works. There's also this electroosmosis issue. Electrophoresis works because you are applying an electrical force on the polymers you are trying to separate. If the polymers were not polyelectrolytes, if they were not charged, there would not be nearly as much force. Now there would not be zero force because the dielectric constant inside the um, polymer chain is different than the dielectric constant in water. And therefore, if you apply an electrical field gradient, you can cause things to move because they become have a, surf, a surface charge, and the surface charge can interact with a field gradient. This is called dielectrophoresis. Uh, the other question you might have asked, however, is, Suppose the background polymer 
instead of being neutral, were also charged? Could you then get a separation? Well, that might sound to be slightly more obscure as a question, but in fact there is a literature answer based on the centrifugation data. That is, if you are sitting doing, this is chapter two, centrifugal separations of several species in a polymer matrix, it is probably the case that the polymer is not exactly density matched with the solvent. And therefore you are running the experiment and the species you're trying to separate are all falling up through solution, but your matrix polymer is also moving. And so and it turns out, for example, if the matrix polymer is moving faster than the separating species, it still manages to slow down their motion. Uh, by analogy then, it should be possible to do electrophoresis in a solution that contains charged polymers as the matrix. The very serious complication though is that if you have all of these charged objects in solution and you apply an electric field, you get heating. And heating leads to all sorts of complications that you don't want. So as a, the answer is yes, you could do it, but you might find some interesting challenges. Well, what's life without challenges? Okay, other questions? Um, professor, um, in, the, in, in um, this chapter, it mentioned about the shear, shear thinning. So can you talk about the shear thinning uh, effect in the electrophoresis? Shear thinning, oh. Okay, I will briefly comment on shear thinning. The notion on shear thinning is as follows. We have polymer solution. If you put most polymers in most solvents, the viscosity of the solution goes up. And you can measure this take two parallel plates have one of them moving this way and the other one stationary, and you get a force that you have to apply to move the upper plate with respect to the lower one. Now you may ask, how do you manage to have two plates and not worry about the ends? Answer, one of the plates is flat. The other plate, I'm looking at a cross section, is a circle, it's shaped like a cone, I rotate the conical object with respect to the flat object. And gee, at this point, the cone is coming out of the board towards us, isn't it? Yes. And the plate is sitting there. And therefore, there is a velocity zero in this direction down here. There is a velocity substantial in this direction up here. And this figure refers to that, except these two lines over here are coming out of the board towards you. And so this object is moving at some distance. This is stationary. And there's a velocity gradient. And I have to apply a force to get the upper plate to move. However, if I have shear thinning, there is also something called shear thickening, though I don't talk about it in the book. If I have shear thickening, if I increase the velocity of the upper plate, the force does not increase linearly. That is, the apparent viscosity of the liquid, the resistance to motion, falls as I move the upper plate faster and faster. And so if I plot the apparent viscosity, the resistance to motion, versus, oops. well, you could plot it that way, but the simpler way is to plot it versus the um, velocity gradient. You get on a log log plot curves that look like that. And there is a low shear region in which the viscosity is independent of how fast you're moving the upper plate. And if you move the plate sufficiently faster, this curve falls off. So far, so good? <laughs>
That's shear thinning. Shear thickening, in shear thickening, you would see something like that. Well, the notion is, because you are moving objects very fast through solution, at least fast relative to the distances between them and their neighbors, one explanation for the behaviors you see is that you are getting shear thinning and the apparent velocity of the apparent viscosity of the medium falls because the particles are moving so sufficiently fast. Why do we say shear thinning rather than thickening? Well, there's one of these in the book, though it uses slightly different axes. And we plot as a function of polymer concentration the viscosity of the solution and we plot one over the mobility, that is we plot the drag of moving particle fields, and we get one curve for the viscosity, and we get a different curve for the mobility, and or one over the mobility, and so adding polymer increases the viscosity a lot, but it doesn't increase the resistance to particle motion by nearly the same amount. This behavior where the viscosity does not tell you the particle mobility is actually quite uniformly found. Other questions before I push on to chapter four? So would you, would you mean that the, there is no time for the polymer or for the, uh, for the small molecules to react at the uh, but it's not increase, right? Um, well, there are, two, there are two answers to your question. Mm -hmm. The first is, if I have an object moving through solution and I have polymer coils here, if the object is moving very slowly, the polymers just diffuse and get out of the way of the object. And the, the motion of the polymers is what they would be if the object weren't there. If I move this object very quickly through solution, the polymer molecules are dragged along and forced out of the way. And the motion of the polymers near the moving object becomes very different than the motions it would have if the object were moving slowly. That's sheer thinning. The second part, though, in terms of a response is there is also what is known as nonlinear viscosity, where you are, for example, applying a shear, and you suddenly change the shear rate. And so you are rotating the disk quickly, and you suddenly slow down how fast you're moving it. Yes? The polymer solution has to notice that you've changed how fast you're moving the rotating object and respond to the change. And it takes a while for the polymer solution to respond and for its viscosity to go over to the value that corresponds to the new motion. That's nonlinear viscosity. It's discussed in chapter 14. So far so good? OK. The last thing I am going to do is to talk about today about light scattering. Now, chapter four actually has a bunch of pieces in it, and I am only going to focus on the scattering piece that I don't talk about in full detail in the chapter. I also talk in that chapter about diffusion and sorts of diffusion. I will talk about that first. I also talk about methods for calculating diffusion of colloidal particles, we're going to skip that because it's a bit remote from your professional interests, and the calculations are actually fairly intricate. However, having said we're going to skip that, let us first look at the question of diffusion. The original experiment goes back to a German by the name of Fick, who started out, for example, putting a drop of ink into water and measuring the ink as it spread out through the water. Okay? And 
he eventually proposed Fick's law. And Fick's law was that the diffusion current, it's a vector, it's a flow of material in some direction. I'll do this in one dimension. Jx, the current in one direction, was a constant d, the diffusion coefficient. And the diffusion coefficient multiplies the concentration gradient. So if the concentration is uniform, there's no net flux of molecules. However, if I have more particles here and fewer particles there, there's a net diffusion current that tends to make the concentration gradient go away. Now, fixed derivation of fixed law was, well, this is exactly like Fourier's result for the diffusion of heat, except instead of observing the diffusion of phlogiston, which was a mythical chemical element, which was the chemical element that was heat. Well, there isn't such a thing. Uh, instead of measuring the diffusion of phlogiston, we are measuring the diffusion of ink. And instead of having a temperature gradient, which was said to be the concentration of this mythical element, we have a concentration gradient of what we would now say is a real chemical substance. And hey, it works. It works reasonably well. However, if we advance forwards to oh, 1970, this was known in some fields before then, there are two sorts of experiments that you can imagine trying. First of all, here is a solution. Those things are solutes. There's space in between a solvent. And I will go in and find one molecule, and I will tag it in some way so I can observe the motion of that one molecule relative to its background. And I discover, at least at long times, that the mean square distance it's traveled is linear in time and proportional to a constant d, that is the diffusion coefficient. However, this diffusion coefficient is d sub s, the self or single particle diffusion coefficient. And the reason it's called the single particle diffusion coefficient is that you are just measuring the motion of this one particle relative to a uniform background. That's self-diffusion. Now, how do you tag a particle? Well, there are actually lots of different ways of doing it. One thing you can do is to chemically modify the particle to atta attach a dye, dye to it. And the simplest thing to do is you watch for the dye to spread out into solution. A more complicated version is to say, well, if I have the dye and I hit it very hard with a laser pulse, the dye molecule decomposes and I have bleached the dye white, and I can produce in solution a bunch of zones, straight lines, where there's very little dye left, and in between there is dye. And then I can measure how fast those zones disappear. I'll discuss in a piece how you do this. A third thing you could do is to say, I will take a small, a very small volume, and I will observe it through a microscope, and I will illuminate it with a very bright light every so often, and I will count how many um, dye-labeled particles, there will be a few maybe, there are in the volume, and, on the, uh, and I will also measure how long it takes for that number to change. Because in order for that number to change, one of these particles in the very little volume has to diffuse to the edge of the volume and head out into the rest of the solution. And so I do these measurements, and from these measurements I can determine the diffusion coefficient of the tagged particle. Another way to do this involves uh, what is called pulsed field gradient nuclear magnetic resonance, 
we will see this technique going by us on a few occasions. Suffice to say, this is a technique that uses NMR to measure how long it takes a, a, a tagged particle, a spin tagged particle, to move a certain distance through solution. Well, that's nice, but there's another way I could do the diffusion measurement. I could do the diffusion measurement by emulating Professor Dr. Fick. And what Professor Dr. Fick did, in essence, was to say, I will produce a solution where there's an ink drop that's gone in, and therefore there are bunches of ink molecules here. There are fewer ink molecules out here, but there might be some, because I only wash my glassware a certain with a certain degree of vigor. And therefore, if I plot concentration versus position, I see something that looks like this. Yes? And I then ask, well, what happens as time goes on? And the answer is time goes on. The particles over here on the average move that way. Yeah, a few particles over here might move in the other direction, but there weren't many particles over here. And the particles here, whatever the solute is, it's concentrated. They see each other and jostle each other and try to shove each other downhill, down the concentration gradient. Well, shove and jostle is obviously a bit oversimplified. And one of the late sections of chapter 4 does this with considerably more precision. However, the important issue is that I get a diffusion current here, J which is the diffusion current that Fick described. And this D is M. And D sub M is the mutual or pair diffusion coefficient. The mutual diffusion coefficient describes the relative motion of two particles in solution, or equivalently, the two thing calculations turn out to be the same, it describes the motion of particles down a concentration gradient. That's the mutual diffusion coefficient. Um, an important result for light scattering is that if I plot dm or dc versus concentration, D, um, ds I mean, the self-diffusion coefficient falls off as I increase the concentration of particles because they just get in each other's way. On the other hand, for the mutual diffusion coefficient, there are two effects one of which is that the particles in some sense are getting in each other's way and the other is they tend to push on each other and push each other away from each other and therefore the mutual diffusion coefficient may fall a bit or rise a bit or rise quite impressively with increasing concentration the important issue though is that the self and mutual diffusion coefficients are not equal Okay. Now, there, you will find people using other terms in the literature. And one of the terms you will find is the collective diffusion coefficient. And the collective diffusion coefficient is just the mutual diffusion coefficient. You will also find people who will refer to something they call the interdiffusion coefficient. Things are interdiffusing, diffusing through each other. And unfortunately, as far as I can tell, some people mean mutual and some people mean self. And this term is not always used with complete consistency. Well, single authors are consistent. Most people are very good about that, actually. But if you read the literature and you find a half dozen papers which say interdiffusion, you had better read very carefully what their experimental method is and what they did in order to tell what they're talking about. Um, 
So those are the diffusion coefficients. And now I will say a few words about scattering. So the notion is we have some object off of which we're going to scatter light, x-rays, whatever. Uh, scattering is very uniformly used in, to study objects through physics, material science. The thing doing the scattering can be described as a wave, but the thing doing the scattering, well, it could be light. It could be x-rays, which are basically the same as light, but much shorter in wavelength. You can do scattering of neutrons, because neutrons, if they all have the same speed and momentum, I'm going to get the door just a second. Neutrons behave like a wave. You can also do scattering with electrons. And so you have all of these choices of things for which you can do scattering. But the underlying math is always the same. We have the whatever it is coming in. And the whatever it is coming in can be described as a wave. So here are the wave crests, just like the waves you can see on an ocean beach. And the, except these are traveling waves, and they're very uniformly spaced. And the waves come in, and they strike objects and are scattered in all directions. However, we're going to have off here in the great distance the detector, and the detector is only going to co collect the light that is scattered exactly towards it. Now, the picture I've drawn cheats in one respect. Actually, in order for this to work cleanly, this distance has to be small. Rel small? Yes. Relative to this distance, which has to be large, so that when we collect scattering from different objects, the scattered light or whatever is headed off that way, and the light rays are all almost parallel to each other. Okay. Now, the net, so we're doing scattering, and we collect the scattered light electrons, where whatever they're scattered in one direction. The next thing we say, well, we could say single scattering, or we could say the first order Born approximation. Or we could say Bragg scattering. But whatever we say, the idea is here's the incident light coming in and it scatters and it gives us stuff going that way, yes? This, this, this light is quite intense. This is very dim. Why does it matter? Well, the light going this way could also be scattered off um, atoms and head off in different directions and be rescattered. And if I am sitting here with my detector, in addition to the single scattered light, the light that is only scattered once, if the scattering was strong, I'd see double scattered light that had scattered twice and triple scattered light. And that messes up the mathematics no end. <coughs> So what we're saying is we're looking at something, a solution that is almost transparent. So almost all of the light goes through, and only a little of the light is scattered off to the side. And now what we do, having put in those approximations, we say, well, here is a reference beam. And there is one of these particles of what we choose to be the origin of the coordinate system. And the light that marches along this path and that path has a phase of zero when it gets to the detector. But what about the light that 
it charges along like this, gets to here, heads off like that, and eventually gets to the detector. Well, it had to travel faster, yes. As light moves, its phase changes. And because the light along this path had to travel faster, the, its phase, when it gets to the detector, is not the same as the phase of this light. What happens if you combine two light rays, monochromatic light rays, having different phases? Interference. Yes? Yeah. If you think back to freshman physics, maybe, you take a laser beam and you shine it through, oh, a, a handkerchief works, a piece of cloth, and the laser beam goes through a bunch of holes and you get this remarkable pattern of speckles and dots and lines on the wall because the light rays add coherently and sometimes they add constructively and the light is bright and sometimes they add destructively and the light is dim. Yes? Well, that's fine. But what we would like to do is the math that tells us what the change in the phase is. And in order to do that, what we notice, it, what we say is, as the light moves, if we take a snapshot at one instant in time, and if we could see the light rays, The light here is traveling in this dis direction and has what is called the wave vector k initial. k initial points in the direction the light is moving. And it has magnitude 2 pi over lambda of the light. Ditto here, the light is going that way and it has wave vector k final, meaning it's going that way. And k final has wavelength 2 pi over lambda. And I have implicitly put in the last approximation before I do the calculation. And the last approximation is the initial wavelength and the final wavelength before and after scattering are the same. That is, the light is scattering off this object, so there must be some momentum transfer to it. But the energy that is transferred to this object is extremely small. The energy transferred to this object is very small. And therefore, I approximate the light here and the light there as having the same wavelength. Well, it appears to me that I am out of time. And therefore, I will finish this discussion next time. In addition, uh, in the next lecture, we will get started on chapter 5. And in chapter 5, we discuss the motion of solvent molecules and other small molecules.